Something in the Cellar by A. G. J. Ruff Charlie Talbot was, by nature, an extremely possessive and almost insanely jealous man. Consequently, when he found his wife, Stella, in what could only be politely described as an extremely compromising situation with his business partner, Clive Ratcliffe, one might naturally have expected him to explode in a fit of emotional fury and physical violence. Surprisingly, Charlie did neither of these things. He just stood stock still in the bedroom doorway while his face darkened from red to purple as he stared at them, wide-eyed. His tightly compressed lips turned down in a white line that suggested both disgust and contempt. Every now and then his short, fat frame shook with an uncontrollable spasm of rage, but he said and did nothing. Stella and Clive clung to each other, prepared for the onslaught that never came. When it became obvious that Charlie didn't intend to kill them there and then, they were understandably relieved. As soon as Clive managed to shake off the paralysing grip of fear, he rolled off the bed, grabbed his trousers, dashed out of the house, and within the space of a few minutes was several miles away. Stella didn't move. She lay naked on the bed, exposed and vulnerable, until Charlie turned on his heel and stormed out of the room, slamming the door behind him. Then she got dressed. Stella was surprised when Charlie made no further reference to the incident. During the weeks that followed, he hardly spoke to her at all, but there was nothing strange about that, because Charlie had always been a man of very few words. Once upon a time Stella had admired him for his strong silence, but now she hated it, as she did almost everything else about him. The trouble was that Stella needed plenty of physical love and attention. Charlie had long since ceased to give her either, so she had looked elsewhere for the physical pleasures that Charlie had failed to provide. Stella had serious doubts as to whether she would ever see Clive again. She was already compiling a list of young men who she thought might possibly jump at the chance of filling the space he had left vacant. Charlie had different ideas. Now that his fears with regard to Stella's extramarital behaviour had been confirmed, he kept her on a much tighter rein. He seldom let her out of his sight and even took to doing most of his work at home, instead of at the office. He was determined that Stella would never get a chance to make a fool of him again. When the time came for Charlie's annual business conference, he took great pains in devising a plan to ensure Stella's fidelity during his absence. He couldn't take Stella with him because her presence would seriously interfere with his own private arrangements. His secretary was, after all, very attractive. No, Stella would stay where she was, very much so, in fact. Stella was overjoyed at the prospect of having three weeks to herself. With Charlie hundreds of miles away in Austria, she would have ample opportunity to rid herself of some of her pent-up frustration. She was so busy making plans that she didn't notice the sound that Charlie made as he worked in the cellar. The night before he was due to leave, Charlie walked up to Stella, gave her a friendly smile, and then hit her so hard with his large meaty fist that she didn't wake up until he had carried her deep down into the dark, damp cellar. When she finally regained her senses, Stella was able to examine Charlie's work at first hand. He had removed a great deal of masonry from the cellar wall and had dug out a small cave, about six feet square, in the tightly packed earth behind it. Charlie had driven a large wooden post into the floor of the cave and had chained Stella to it by her left wrist. She shook her head and looked up to see Charlie, still smiling, mixing cement out in the cellar, jaundicedly illuminated by a single naked electric bulb. Although she fully realised her position, Stella didn't panic. Her senses were still numbed by the crushing blow she had received. What are you doing, Charlie? She asked in a small shaky voice, nervously fingering the chain on her wrist. This, my love, chuckled Charlie, vigorously turning and patting the cement with his shovel, is the modern man's answer to the chastity belt. Stella said nothing. Her head was still spinning. 
She gave an involuntary start as a rat scuffled past her in the darkness. Charlie laughed. Just a rat? I would have thought that you'd be used to them by now. Anyway, if not, you should be after spending three weeks with them. Stella still said nothing, but just stared at him. She believed him all right. Charlie was capable of anything. Charlie was inwardly annoyed by the fact that she was taking it all so calmly. He wanted her to scream. He wanted her to suffer, the deceitful bitch. He was comforted by the thought that she was sure to be screaming before the three weeks were up. He dropped the shovel, stooped down and started to cement the bricks into place. Don't worry, you won't starve, he muttered, pointing to a pile of cardboard boxes and several plastic containers that stood in one corner of the cave. Plenty of food and water, but it'll be bloody dark. But there again, you always were at your best in the dark, weren't you, Stella? Anyway, love, be good and don't do anything I wouldn't. He laughed loudly at his own joke and slapped another brick into place. Stella watched him slowly disappear as the wall grew higher. It took him over two hours to finish the job of walling her up. He left out one brick so that she would be able to breathe and then sat down on the cellar floor and waited for the cement to dry. Stella knew he was still there because the yellow light shone into the cave through the hole in the wall. Finally the light went out and Stella sat in total darkness knowing that Charlie had gone. Charlie wasn't as happy as he should have been. Stella still wasn't screaming. Charlie intended to make a holiday of the trip. Instead of flying to Austria direct, he decided to make the journey by road. In this way, he hoped to be able to admire the scenery and to appreciate more fully the pleasure of Miss Taylor's company. They took the air ferry from Southend Airport to Ostend and from there drove through Belgium and Germany and on towards Austria. It was late at night when the accident happened. Charlie's mind wasn't on driving. His thoughts were divided between those concerning the delightful Miss Taylor, who was curled up on the seat beside him, her head resting lightly on his shoulder, and those about Stella, who was walled up in a cellar many miles away, with only rats and worms for company. Charlie was almost asleep at the wheel when the car slewed off the greasy ribbon of mountain road splintered through the white safety railings and slowly somersaulted down towards the floor of the valley below. Charlie glimpsed the headlights, insanely illuminating first the wall of the cliff, then the scudding clouds in the night sky above, and finally the jagged rocks towards which they were plunging. As the car tumbled, Charlie was thrown about like a helpless rag doll. He could hear Miss Taylor screaming a long drawn out and terrified scream. He had the ridiculous thought that it was Stella who should have been screaming. It was the only thought he had time for before pain came at him from every direction as the car ploughed into the rocks. Metal warped and twisted as if in the crushing grip of a giant hand, and then everything was suddenly silent. The staff at the hospital did their best. They straightened Charlie's broken bones, amputated two of his fingers, stitched him up and left him lying in a coma. Their best wasn't good enough for Miss Taylor. They could probably have saved her life if they had been able to find all the pieces. As it was, she was dead within an hour of her arrival at the hospital. Charlie lay in a coma for nine months before he returned to the conscious world of the living. As soon as he was able to think for himself, his first thoughts were of Stella. He was scared because the sole responsibility for what he assumed had resulted in his wife's death rested on him. He didn't voice his fears for that very same reason. He hadn't intended to kill her, but he had become, nevertheless, a murderer. Charlie's remaining months at the hospital passed with agonising slowness. He slept very little. But when he did, his dreams were haunted by ghastly visions of Stella's rotten corpse lying deep beneath the earth, covered in dust and cobwebs, 
with white glazed eyes staring blindly at the rodents that gnawed away at her mouldering flesh. The dreams became so bad that he didn't sleep at all during his last week at the hospital. He just lay quietly in his bed, forcing his eyes to stay open until the coming of dawn. It was a full year before Charlie's doctors pronounced him fit enough to return home. They warned him that he was still very weak and instructed him to take things easy for a few months, avoiding all unnecessary excitement. They were totally unaware of the tension and defevered excitement that he felt, even as he left the hospital. The house was exactly as he had left it. Before leaving the German hospital, he had telephoned his office so that they would get somebody to clean out the house in preparation for his return home. He deposited his suitcases in the hallway and wandered from room to room, all the while trying to resist the compulsion to go straight down to the cellar. He wanted time to prepare himself for what he might find there. Charlie was both relieved and surprised by the fact that nobody so far anyway had questioned Stella's disappearance. He assumed that this was probably due to the extremely limited social life that he and Stella had led. They had very few friends, and those same friends were probably under the impression that Stella had gone to Germany to attend him during his stay in hospital. It was reasonable to assume, therefore, that they would expect her to return home with him. It would probably prove necessary to fabricate a story of some sort to explain her absence, but that was a bridge he would cross when he came to it. Charlie didn't want to go into the cellar, but he found himself drawn irresistibly towards it. His eyes rested on the heavy wooden door that stood before him, slightly ajar. He reached forward to close it, but as he did so, he could have sworn he heard the metallic rattle of a chain from somewhere down below. For a moment he stood frozen with terror. It was impossible even to think that Stella might still be alive. Her supply of food and water would barely have lasted four weeks. He refused to believe his ears. Then he heard it again. Charlie's hand was shaking as he pulled open the door, switched on the light and made his way slowly down the stairs. Now the only sound he could hear was that of his own harsh breathing and the creak of the staircase as he took each hesitant step downward. Beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead and, as he reached the cellar floor, he licked his lips nervously before going over and placing his ear against the cold, damp wall. For a few moments he heard nothing. But then, very faintly, came the sound of a low moan, followed by a further, louder rattling of the chain. There was silence for a short while, and then came the noise of something sharp, scraping at the inside of the wall, very close to his ear. Then the scraping stopped, and Charlie nearly collapsed with fright when he heard a feeble, cracked voice speaking to him. Is that you, Charlie? wheezed the voice. Charlie pulled his ear sharply away from the brickwork and stood, mouth agape, staring at the wall in disbelief. Stella was still alive. It seemed impossible, yet he had heard her voice. This sudden realisation snapped him into action. Hang on, Stella, I'll get you out, he shouted, frantically looking for something suitable with which to break through the wall. He snatched up the shovel and swung it violently against the brickwork. The recoil of the blow sent the shovel spinning out of his hands and it clattered to the floor. The wall was undamaged. Charlie searched elsewhere and eventually found a sledgehammer lying with an assortment of rusty gardening implements under some sacking in a dark corner. He dragged the formidable hammer out of the darkness, swung it onto his shoulder and approached the wall. With his first thudding blow, the brickwork began to crumble. He worked in a frenzy, swinging the hammer harder and faster as the hole in the wall became larger. His breath came in short, laboured gasps, and the frantic pounding of his heart hammered in his ears. When his strength began to fail him, he dropped the hammer and began to tear the loosened bricks out of the wall with his bare hands. Finally the job was finished, and Charlie sank to his knees, exhausted, with blood dripping from his raw fingers. Through the darkness and the settling dust, he could make out a dim figure. Crouched in a black corner of the cave, 
Charlie coughed as the irritating dust found its way into his lungs, and as he did so, the crouching figure stirred. The figure dragged itself, slowly and deliberately, out into the yellow light of the cellar, and Charlie saw her clearly for the first time in over a year. Charlie stopped coughing as suddenly as he had begun. He tried to scream, but all he could manage was a strangled croak. Stella's face was only two feet from his own, and what he saw wasn't at all like the Stella that he remembered. A green fungoid growth had sprouted from her left eye socket, and had eaten its way through the flesh of her cheek, exposing the bleached white bone beneath. Large patches of her hair had fallen out, leaving moist red sores in their place. The bottom lip of her slack, shapeless mouth hung down to reveal a jagged row of pointed yellow teeth. A trickle of blood dribbled down over her chin, and in one gnarled claw she clutched a half-devoured rat. She stared at Charlie with one white, sightless, sunken eye, set in a pillow of bloated grey flesh, and then, groping out of her personal darkness, she stretched a horny hand towards him. I knew you wouldn't forget me, Charlie. She dragged herself closer to him. Kiss me, Charlie, kiss me. Charlie was nearly sick. He found the strength to pull himself to his feet and would probably have fled from the cellar if it hadn't been for the sharp stabbing pain that he suddenly felt deep in his chest. He staggered to the far wall and leaned against it for support. He knew that he had nothing to fear while Stella was chained to the wooden post. When the pain had hit him, Charlie had instinctively clenched his teeth and closed his eyes. However, when he heard a shuffling noise, he looked up to see the grotesque figure of Stella tottering towards him. Somehow she had managed to unfasten the chain, and he watched with terror as she came closer and closer. He pressed himself tightly against the wall, and managed to raise one arm to defend himself before the pain in his chest exploded in an all-consuming fire, and he crumpled to the floor. The beating of his heart ceased to thunder in his ears, and the silence was broken only by the rattling gurgle that died in his throat. Charlie twitched a few times, and then everything was still. Stella carefully removed her elaborate makeup and then made a telephone call. They came in an ambulance and took Charlie away in it. The doctor was very kind, but he did say that Charlie should never have been knocking walls down in his condition. Anyway, he was dead and nothing they could do or say would change that. Stella was pleased with the way that things had worked out. She wasn't too scared when Charlie walled her up in the cellar, because she knew something that he didn't. Clive, naturally enough, had been aware of Charlie's impending business trip and had phoned her beforehand in order to arrange a meeting for as soon as possible after Charlie left home. Fortunately, Charlie had been in the bathroom when the phone rang, so he knew nothing about the conversation. Clive had turned up only a few hours after Charlie's departure, and he had let himself into the house with a key that Stella had given to him some months previously. Stella had been able to hear Clive's car drive up to the house because the driveway passed directly over the portion of the cellar in which she was imprisoned. As soon as she knew that Clive was in the house, she had shouted and rattled her chain for all she was worth. Fortunately, Clive had heard her and had come to the rescue. After that, it had been easy for them to keep tabs on Charlie while he lay in a hospital bed somewhere in Germany. Charlie had played right into their hands when he had phoned the office to let them know that he was coming home. It had given them plenty of time to make their plans. Going back into the cellar had been Stella's own idea. She had done a good deal of theatrical work before she married Charlie, so she had been well prepared for the part that she intended to play. She had spent hours preparing her face, and when she was ready, Clive had obligingly walled her up in the cellar again. Then she had sat patiently in the darkness and waited for Charlie. Stella was pleased, both with her performance and its outcome. Now she had Clive and Charlie's half of the business. Of course, she wouldn't work at the office the way Charlie had done. 
Clive would have to find another man to do that. Somehow Stella couldn't help wondering who the man would be, and hoping that she would find him attractive.